This is Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. Wherever you're listening from, welcome. I'm your host, Colin Hansen, and I'm glad you're here for today's conversation. It's the fundamental lie of modern life, says Alan Noble, that we are our own. Compared to our ancestors, we're less worried about war. That's a good thing. We're less worried about starvation and famine. But by believing that we are our own, we tend to struggle with new problems, the loss of meaning, identity, and purpose. Noble says this in his new book, You Are Not Your Own, Belonging to God in an Inhuman World, published by InterVarsity, says this, Everyone is on their own private journey of self-discovery and self-expression, so that at times, Modern life feels like billions of people in the same room shouting their name so that everyone else knows they exist and who they are, which is a fairly accurate description of social media. Noble's book feels like a douse of cold water that wakes us from our delusion. His book builds off the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism, and he helps us find our way back to this well-worn path of divine wisdom. He writes this, ourselves belong to God, and we are joyfully limited and restrained by the obligations, virtues, and love that naturally come from this belonging. Noble is assistant professor of English at Oklahoma Baptist University. He's co-founder and editor-in-chief of Christ and Pop Culture. You may know his previous work, Disruptive Witness, Speaking Truth in a Distracted Age, He joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss the sickness of modern life, the burden of freedom, and the power of Caligula, among other subjects. Alan, thank you for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. You know, hearing that description of my book, I was thinking, I I agree with that. So I guess (laughs) I... (laughs) <laughs> I guess that's a good sign. So it's typically a good sign for an author, but who knows how long ago you wrote this and who exactly. knows what happened in the middle. So <laughs> Exactly. That's my point. And you're like, oh, you know, those are good words. So <laughs> just in case you're wondering, I'm still there. I'm still <laughs> at that place. <laughs> Let's jump right in, Alan. You say the modern person is aware of more suffering and injustice than a person living at any other time in history. Is uh, that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a thing. Um, Well, so uh, there are good things about it. So I have more agency to. So, for example, uh, just this week in Haiti, a group of, I think, 17 missionaries were kidnapped by by gang members. So um, I can pray about that immediately. And that's awesome. Um, so that's that's a positive thing. Uh, the other aspect of that is that there is so much going on in the world that I can't adequately give the attention that all the problems of the world deserve. And um, that means I have to come with uh, come up with coping mechanisms to figure out what what do I attend to, what do I not attend to, what do I invest my time in, what am I responsible for, what am I not responsible for, and it's a lot because everyone's telling me that I have to care about everything. It's sometimes on sh- social media, people will be like, "Why haven't you spoken out about X?" And I'm like, "I didn't know X happened yet. Why are you why are you yelling at me?" Um, but that's the kind of world we live in. Uh, now, just. Yeah, we could talk a lot about that. I mean, I I think I I kind of guessed that your answer would be it is because the fact is with any technological development, the good comes, the bad comes, and it's our job to try to sift through both of those. So, and when, as long as prayer is an option for us as Christians, then it can be a good thing, but the kind of Mm -hmm. helplessness it also can engender and the anger it can engender is, is a problem. Now, what do you mean that the church in the West tends to be good at helping people cope with modern life, but not undoing the disorder of modern life? So I, I think, uh, and, and to be clear, uh, the church, I, when I say this, I, I don't think that they're doing anything particularly irresponsible. I think that most of society is helping us cope rather than dealing with the problems. So, for example, um, you know, we might have congregations, hypothetically, where 
parents are living frantic, worried lives that they are pressured to be um, parents who are doing everything, taking their kids to all kinds of events where the husband and wife uh, have very difficult time making time for each other, spending any time together, where they're constantly being asked at work to allow their work to creep into their home hours by email or you know working from home or whatever it might be. So lives that are hectic, that are frantic, where there's a constant gnawing sense that they're overwhelmed and um, falling behind. And sometimes what can happen is that churches, rather than hel helping people look at the disordered way in which we are living and, and, and identify that and say, okay, this is not right. We need to live differently. Sometimes what we can do is, is just um, help people cope. And that's not necessarily like we do need ways to cope because some of these problems, we can't just wish away. They're going to be here. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be able to do both. Like we need, we need that, that, that comfort and that coping, but we also need to be admonished to, um, to challenge ways of living in the world. My oldest child is only six. And one of the challenges I face as a parent that continues to come up is that I feel as though I'm always falling behind with him. Like there's something he's missing out on. And I keep having to remind myself that I heard uh, from advice I heard from Jen Wilkin years ago, which was, why do you, why do we feel as though there's always some activity, some skill, some event that we're missing out on with our kids. And she said, because a lot of people want your money mm -hmm. <laughs> and they convince you that you need yeah. to do these things. And those people that, that didn't exist a generation ago, certainly didn't exist two generations ago and beyond. So why do you feel that way? Because a lot of people are marketing you that way. Um, you, you don't mince words, Alan, in this book. You, you say that we treat mothers, um, or you say that the way we treat mothers, and especially in relation and also careers and work, is sick. Mm. Why, why do you say that? So this is partly coming out of my own wife's experience, watching my wife go through this. She has two master's, master's degrees, one in English and one in economics. And for a number of years um, after I first got my job here at Oklahoma Baptist, she uh, was, was not working and she was staying home with the kids. And she would always have these awkward interactions with, with other adults when they would first meet her, they would ask, so what do you do? And the implication is, what do you do for a career? And so when she would reply, well, you know, I'm staying home with my kids right now, even if they were people who had positive views about that, who supported stay-at-home moms, they might say something like, wow, that's great. So what does your husband do? There's always this sort of, even among people who, who support this, very conservative evangelical people, a kind of acknowledgement that, hey, this is great, but your life is on pause. You're not a very interesting person um, because you're not pursuing this career. And uh, that, of course, is sick. I mean, it's, 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 it's bizarre that we would look at people who choose to raise children, which is one of the most fundamentally human things you can do is help humans grow, right? And view that activity as less than or as empty, as meaningless, as wasted time, uninteresting time in your life. Um, so so that's 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 what I have in mind. And behind that is this idea that that career can be one of the primary ways we define ourselves. And if you don't have something exciting and interesting that you're pursuing in your career, then you're just sort of wasting your life. And you need two people working because you have to be able to pay for all of those kids activities that we just described right there, not to mention all the other things that were marketed. Um, Alan, do you see the meaning of life as more freedom to discover or a burden? Because right, you describe this choice as the defining dynamic of our modern anthropology. So um, it's the way life is presented to us, not actually how it is, but how it is presented to us is, is both. On the one hand, uh, we are offered, we're given this uh, promise, this contemporary promise, which is you can be who you want to be. Your life is a project. You're the one in charge of it. You're the only one who can make something interesting and significant out of it. And you have all the options available to you 
you can change your personality, your body, your habits, your name, whatever. Everything is plastic and available for you to play with to make something beautiful and interesting with your life. That's the optimistic side. That's this a limitless freedom that we're offered. But very quickly, there's the flip side, which is that also you don't have a choice. You have to create yourself. You, your life is fundamentally a project, and only you can complete the project, and you have to complete the project, and you've got to make it interesting. You've got to make it meaningful, and there are no guidelines. There's no rubric for this. You just have to go and do it, and um, it's that tension that, that's overwhelming. Uh, because we, we uh, on the one hand, we're constantly striving to pursue this. And on the other hand, we're recognizing its insufficiency, the impossibility of actually meeting these expectations, um, which you know can crush us. Alan, when did the concept of this book crystallize for you? At what point did you stop and say, I, I can't, something's wrong here, something's sick here? As Christians, there has to be a better way. Was there a was there a moment? Was there an experience? Something you read? Something that happened to you that made you stop and say, "We've got to think about these things on a deeper, on a deeper level. We we can't just keep coping. We need to seek change." I don't know exactly what triggered it, but I know that um, this was several three three plus years ago, um, and evangelicals were debating some um, hot contemporary social issue, a, a legitimate social issue that, that we were wrestling with. I might have had to do with, you know, secular ethics or the public square and, and gender or orientation, one of those kinds of things. And it struck me that so many of these things that we debate that were, that were in tension with the rest of society uh, hinge on this idea of belonging. They hinge on this idea that, well, that we belong to ourselves. And because we belong to ourselves, these limits, which as Christians, we would say are right and good limits that allow us to actually live freely as human beings made in the image of God. But these limits are, are perceived to be um, uh, inhibiting and destructive and um, you know inhuman, right? And so that was the, the first the first point, because I made that connection with the Heidelberg Catechism and it struck me, um, you know, I think we can, and I tweeted something like this, but that, that the church will be able to weather um, modernity, what we're going through to the extent that we accept that we belong to Christ and to the extent that we um, acclimate, that to the extent that we uh, give in and believe that we belong to ourselves, I think that we will, we will not be able to offer an alternative Witness. So that was so that was going on, sort of in the public square and intellectual uh, side of me. But then, you know, also as I've continued, you know, I finish my PhD and I go to get my first full time teaching job, and I'm raising kids with my wife and going to church, and I'm realizing it doesn't slow down. Like it doesn't get like this is you know people talk about well it's a season. Like I, <laughs> apparently all of life is a season because <laughs> it it it. It is always, there's always this overwhelming pressure to, as you were describing, do more for your kids. And there are things we can, some of these things we can push back on. So you're very consciously saying, okay, when somebody guilts me for not reading to my kid the uh, you know appropriate number of hours per day, I can say, you know what? He's going to be fine. She's going to be fine. You know, and, and this is why, but, but there are some of these things that, that you can't, you just have to, to, to deal with. So I was putting those two things together. The, the, the idea that a lot of the structures in our contemporary world are disordered, fundamentally disordered, and that that very disorder has to do with our anthropology, how we understand who we belong to. It strikes me, Alan, that this level of critique allows you to be able to break out of some of the political dichotomies at a time because you start to realize that Americans across the board, and I don't think it's exclusive to America, that Americans across the board reject, reject constraints. Now, they reject constraints in terms of different issues, different topics. Um, we could easily right. look at that right now, and I don't think we've ever had a, a better example, and I'm not trying to get into the specifics here, but about, <laughs> about vaccines yeah. and abortion. 
Um, just the idea of constraints, demands, it's something that we're very against. And your book is not trying to sort of pick a side in those debates. It's trying to take to elevate our perspective so we can see what it means to live for Christ because we belong to him and we're not then beholden to all these things that are happening kind of in, in the world. We don't have to succumb, I guess, to whatever narratives are coming out of media or things like that. So here's a, this is a little bit more of an experience, Alan, that I've seen on the, on the left. Um, And for a long time, I've observed friends and acquaintances who determine their identity and it's especially their sexuality in a way that requires them to be true to themselves. And when they do that, when they make that declaration, they receive generally positive feedback. And one of the things I've noticed is that there appears to be no regard for the spouse and no regard for the children, especially if that identity requires them to seek a divorce or to leave their family or to forsake that. And I keep wondering, I mean, I keep wondering how do people not see the inconsistency here to be true to yourself means you have to be you have to you have to inflict pain on other people and i'm wondering what makes it so hard for christians to be able to call this out for what it is which is certainly a variation on the good old sin of selfishness yeah and so if, if you assume that you are your own and belong to yourself, then your spouse can't make your life meaningful. Your children can't make your life meaningful. Your community, your church, none of those people or institutions can make your life, the, your life project significant. And so if you know, I looked inside myself and I've discovered this self that has to be authenticated by coming out and expressing, um, and this can happen, as, as you say, in you know sex orientation, um, gender, but lots and lots of other ways. Exactly. I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you pointed out that this is a non-part, like right. that's part of the goal of this is to say, actually, it's so much deeper. Uh, we're talking often about these sex, gender, and orientation issues, which are important, but my my suspicion is that it's it's we're accepting a lot of the same fundamental ideas about belonging um, that we're critiquing over here, and so we need to dig a little bit deeper. Um, but you know, if if that's true, if he if this person belongs to themselves, then gosh, it would actually be foolish and ignorant and wrong for them to not listen to that voice. It's only if they don't belong to themselves that they have to say no to their desires, and then that makes sense. But that's hard for us to accept. And you're right. I mean, I've seen this. I've seen this with with um, with a lot of, um, you know, with uh, I mentioned this in the book, a lot of, you know, heterosexual couples, uh, you know, people in the church who some of them I even admired and respected. And uh, then at some point, um, the husband or wife um, meet someone and realizes that their true life has to be with this other one. And so they they abandon wife and kids is often the way it turns out. And um, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. But if all of society is telling you, no, that's the way you're supposed to live, then it can very easily feel, it can very easily feel normal. Um, So the challenge, I think part of the challenge for the church is seeing not only the very obvious cases where we see, okay, this person is making a choice to follow their true self, quote unquote, and it's hurting others, as you point out, um, in this relationship, but also see the other ways in which we do that. So, for example, how do we choose occupations and careers and purchase things and live in the world where we're saying, I'm going to pursue my desires and my appetite and my will, even if it hurts other people? Um, and I think if we're honest with ourselves, there's there's quite a few ways that we do that. In fact, I would say anyone who reads this book and feels like, well, those other people are going to feel really guilty reading this book. They're probably not reading it honestly. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it, Alan. It, it seems as though, to give an example of what I'm speaking about here, that a generation ago, we might have thought, okay, the 50-year-old deacon in your church who leaves his wife and his five kids for the 28-year-old woman even if he says, I'm, I'm doing this for me, and this is who I really am, this is my true love, we would still, generally speaking, see that as being 
selfish. Mm -hmm. Um, But now in recent years, we see the exact same scenario play out with the wife who decides that she's a lesbian Mm -hmm. or the father who decides that he's always been a woman Mm -hmm. and the same issues play out. And yet all of a sudden they seem to get encouragement. Whereas in the past, at least you would have said, come on, you know what this is here. Yeah. But that, that's part of how sexual identity and orientation has been elevated to such a level tied to our identity that it's very hard for us to push back on that. But I think also it's hard for us to push back on that because all of us are compromised in some ways when it comes to thinking that we belong to ourselves. And related to that, Alan, yeah. it seems as though we all want to feel unique and yet we're all on the same journey together. I mean, we're all unique doing the exact same things. And I'm wondering from your perspective, is this just consumer marketing all the way down? I mean, I, <laughs> I, I'm struck by your description in the book of the teenager who defines her public identity by music that rejects judgment from anyone else. Right. And this, and this stu- student who's very clearly expressing herself um, through the music actually does want you to judge them um, right. because judgment is, an, is a kind of evaluation. So they want to, yeah. So there's always that, uh, that, that um, paradox in identity. We want to be original, but we only have the tools given to us by society. So is it marketing? Is it consumerism all the way down? Well, yes and no. And, and I do think that it's in that that sometimes um so let me say that all of the ideas i discuss in this book none of them are none of them are new that that better smarter people than me have been talking about them long before then so for example these questions about um expressive individualism and identity old topics but they continue to be relevant which is why i felt it was still worth writing not just continue Uh, increasingly so increasing yeah Um, it's it's intense yeah so um you know that has been written about um, for a long time. Now I'm forgetting what your 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 question was. Oh well, just is it just consumer marketing? This everybody oh, unique right. in their own in, in exactly the same way, or is there something else going on? So I think a lot of the critics have been good about looking at the something else, and um, and I think it's very hard. I don't think we can entirely extrapolate and, and, and separate the, the role of the market uh, in the rise of individualism and identity formation. Um, I think that any account of, of, of expressive individualism today has to have a, a, a heavy emphasis upon the, the, the forces of consumerism. But it is not just consumerism. I, I mean, secularism is, is part of it. Um, we live in what Zygmunt Bauman calls liquid modernity. So there's a lack of solidity to our lives. We our our identities, our personhood, our value, our worth is constantly being questioned and tested. And so it makes sense for us to pursue identities and pursue expressing those identities to give us a sense of stability. Like I know who I am. So the teenager who is expressing herself through this music, it's a way of projecting out into the world and saying, I, I am someone observe me. I am someone, uh, which is, you know, we all want to be affirmed in that way to have someone see us and recognize us and accept us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, uh, one of the things you write about in this book is how a lot of the ideas came out of working with young people. Mm. And uh, I'm, I'm in a church where there are a lot of young people. Why do you think that younger millennials, Gen Z have a hard time finding community? But I guess I have another question. Is this even something you find that they desire? The sense of like belonging to yeah. a community? Yeah. Just friendships, yeah. community. I think, no, I absolutely think that they, uh, that they do. And I think um, y- you will find that many of them are really hungry for it, that they're willing and they are ready to give themselves to something because a lot of them feel that the, the, what they have been taught from a very young age, that the kind of achievement that is necessary for them, the kind of making, as I said, this project out of their life, they've got to achieve these things and be this person and, and be the best version of themselves or whatever, live their truth, all, all, all of that. 
um, it's exhausting and they feel overwhelmed. So I very frequently counsel, you know, seniors in college who, who realize, okay, now I have to leave and go out into what is, has been called the real world, even though college is real. And I'm terrified because if I make the wrong decision about who to marry or what career to pursue, then that project might get off rail, off, off track. And then my life comes to, to nothing. And so, um, when they hear this idea that, well, okay, but what if your life is not about you? Like, what if you don't belong to yourself? And so this whole project idea is, is a lie. And instead, you belong to Christ. And so there are limits and there are things for you to sacrifice for. Um, I think a lot of them resonate. They resonate with that. They're excited. Um, I think they're excited about that because they want something to have meaning and for it to be real and rich and um, give them purpose. Yeah, I'm, I'm preparing some talks to deliver next week at a Christian college and was just reviewing that this week. And one of my big application points is that I hope you go off and you change the world, but I also hope that some of you will just consider moving back to where you came from. Oh man. Amen. Go, going, going back yes. to your home church that, that baptized you, the church that sent you off to college, the church where people know you and have loved you. I said, just consider that. Amen. You know, I feel like sometimes I had, I had a conversation just last week with a college student who was feeling this kind of same existential crisis about, okay, what do I do after school next year? And so we talked about the fact that she could just get a nine to five job that just, just, you know, a, a, a job that's ethical, that's good for her community and then serve in her church, love her family. And that's it. And she's like, that is so freeing. And the thing is, is like we've uh, school teachers and parents and other adults and, you know, um, you know, role models have all been telling us, you've got to follow your dream. You've got to be achieving. You've got to do the, you know, this college and then this career and do the best and nothing necessarily wrong with that in isolation. But when that is the overwhelming burden that's placed. You know, this student felt like she had to be, you know, as you said, change the world in this cosmic sense when, when all we're doing is, you know, being used by Christ uh, as, you know, agents of, uh, of grace. And, and very often what we need, what we so desperately need, I think a lot, I talk to my male students a lot, we, we need, you know, men who are trustworthy, who are faithful, who are safe, who are godly, um, that just that work, you know, forget, uh, you know, the traditional achievements do that work. And, you know, there's so much you can do for the kingdom. This is why I like David Brooks's uh, concept of eulogy virtues, as opposed to resume virtues, because mm. if you take a lot of the advice that young people are getting today and you don't give that advice to them at 20, but you give that advice to them at 70, it sounds ludicrous. Because we understand at age 70 or beyond that your life is lived in what you've given to others and what you've given to a place, what you've given to a family, what you've given to a church, what you've given to a neighborhood. That's how we define success. That's how we define a, a life well lived. If you were to carry out your 20-something angst all the way through <laughs> your 70s and beyond, we would think your life had failed. The, the limits are there because you can't love everyone the same way. It's about your commitment to a place, a commitment to a covenant, a covenant with a church, a covenant before God, ultimately before all, covenant to, uh, to a spouse and then to, to children. So we seem to understand it if we reverse engineer our lives. It seems to be a lot of the confusion comes from projecting out this unknown that is a particular, I think, to this, this life-building project that you describe. You describe in your book, Alan, that the state is committed to neutrality in the common good, so toleration is our highest good. But I, I wonder, don't you see that changing? Because I certainly see a state more than willing to impose a common good when it comes to economics or sexuality or racism. And in fact, even for those people who might disagree with the common good that's being defined those ways right now, want to impose a different common good. I actually don't see many people talking much about toleration right now at all. Mm. I don't remember why I said that. 
So I'm gonna. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. <laughs> I uh, I agree with that first part that you read earlier at the very beginning. Uh, I don't. I'd have to look at the the the, the context of 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 what I said there. Um, because I was actually uh, surprised about that, Alan. That's why I'm yeah. asking you about it because yeah. I thought that I I I could see you writing that ten years ago. Yeah. But it feels like something has really flipped in the last five years or so across the board with people. Yeah. Um, I think this is what I meant. So I'm just, you know, shooting for the hip here because I don't remember. <laughs> I'd have to reread that chapter. This is what I think I meant. Uh, not that they actually achieve tolerance, but the idea is um, that there is no common good for the state to pursue. So um, instead, there's a kind of equilibrium. Now, that equilibrium can be upset if one group gains some cultural uh, capital and uh, pressures others in, in various ways through social media, through boycotts, through, you know, you know, whatever. Um, then, you know, that tilts tilts the balance. But the government doesn't have a specific uh, uh, the state doesn't have a vision of what it means to live a, a good life in community that it's working that it's working towards. I guess yeah. I think that's what I, I think that's what I meant. So there's like a different so, levels you're talking about here then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's a different kind of tall. So yes, yes, that's what I mean. Well, and and even if we say that there is a perspective that government is trying to pursue with the common good, there's not a philosophical foundation for it. There's not a rationale. There's not right. any kind of authority. It no. remains inherently unstable and open to change. And I guess that's my point is how, yeah. if we're living in this liquid modernity, how you can go from a celebration 10 years of tolerance to a widespread repudiation of tolerance across the board in the last yeah. five years, it's hard to know what's next. I don't know what's next. I don't think anybody knows what's mm. next. It's just we can know that things are not a straight line up or down. They seem to be jagged and they lurch in different directions. And I guess that's, that's what happens when there is no common vision for what right. kind of life we're trying to promote. We're Speaking here on Gospel Bound with uh, with my guest Alan Noble, we think we wrote we think he wrote this book. You are not your own, belonging to God in an inhuman world. It's, it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> uh, I got a couple more questions, Alan. You caught my sure. attention with this. We all have the power of Caligula now. What do you mean? Yeah, this is this de depressing reality about the role of of pornography and in in contemporary life or contemporary society it doesn't have to be part of our lives. Um, that, it, it, in my opinion, it reflects a lot of the disordered values that our society has. And so, uh, one of those is that the the self and the self's desires are are good and can be pursued and have a, a right to be pursued. And, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of, of, of different places in our society where corporations in particular are telling us, yes, you deserve this. So for example, I had a donut last week and on the box, it said, you deserve this donut. And I was like, ah, oh, I already had one. I don't think I deserve another one. I put it away. I put it away. Use my willpower. Um, but, um, but so, so, so this is happening in lots of places, but what's interesting is that that pornography, because of the internet, because of where we are and the market, um, it, it's I think the place that where you can have your desires uh, affirmed. Uh, the, the answer is yes, you may. I think is the way I talk about it in the book more than 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 anything else in society, and certainly anything else in history. So, for example, if whatever fetish, whatever desire, whatever fantasy that you want. It's it's out there. Um, you can have that all without restriction, without restraint. Um, I mean, except for a very tiny few exceptions, that which right. as society we say, okay, well that's that's too far. But for the most part, it's wide open, um, and uh, you know that is how we perceive ourselves is at the center of the universe, and so it it, it makes sense. We all have the power of a of a, a Roman emperor to demand that people give their bodies to you for your personal pleasure. Um, yeah. Sad to say, I think if you looked at pornography over the 
preceding decades, you could anticipate a number of cultural trends in there. Mm. That's one of the things that Joe Carter has written for us at the Gospel Coalition about actually the prevalence of lesbian and gay pornography and how that preceded a lot of other cultural changes. If that if that um, if that trend continues, then I think the taboos on incest are about to disappear quickly. Um, if the why are you so depressing? Are, <laughs> I'm yeah, not. I'm just, I'm just now that that is that is discouraging, which is why I'm leading up to my last question. Okay, which is it's a big question, so just feel free right. to take it wherever you want to go. Give us a taste of the resources in Christianity for building meaning, identity, and purpose. And and part of, as I give you a chance to think about that, part of what I bring up, part of why I bring up this um, this example is that we don't remember Cal- Caligula as, wow, I wish I could have been that guy. Generally mm. speaking, that's not how it comes yeah. up. It's seen as like, this was a problem. This is, yeah. this is the epitome of evil decadence. And I... I think that when we look back on pornography, when we look back on a number of the things that you're talking about here, I think they will change because I think they have to change because they're mm. inhuman as you talk yeah. about. So, so as Christians, it's easy to just get really discouraged. And I do think to some extent you need to get discouraged so that you can be vigilant yes. Yes. about it. But then you turn from a vigilance into a hopefulness so help us to make that turn here. This is the hardest part of the book. Um, so you're asking me to talk about one half of the book. And so but that's <laughs> totally fair. That's because totally, we got to talk about hope because it does. It, it ends with hope because we live. Our faith is not a tragedy. It's a comedy in the sense that it ends in a marriage feast of the lamb. Right. Not in in death with no resurrection. And so we do. We have hope. Um, and in writing this, I, as I say in the book, I wish I could have just said, here are the five things that we need to do to retake our civilization or America or whatever, or our families. Or, um, but, but I want to be honest that it's going to be difficult. The example I gave earlier about my wife getting into these conversations and people assuming that she didn't really have much to contribute because she didn't have a career. Well, my wife uh, can learn to be more aware, more self-aware and recognize when people say that, even you know, people who agree with her, her philosophically and theologically about the goodness of raising children for God, et cetera, when they treat her that way, uh, they're wrong. And she can, she can make that r- recognition right. and say, okay, if I'm, if I'm feeling in fear, if I'm feeling guilty, if I'm feeling a kind of shame, that's a lie. And she can push back right. against it. But guess what? Those people are still going to keep doing that. It's not going to stop anytime soon. And so- um, the hope that I offer in the book is I'm trying to offer a sober hope. I, I'm trying to say that there are l- many aspects of, 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 of many inhumane aspects of our society that I don't anticipate changing anytime soon, but we have no right to lose hope. We have no right to, to stop fighting for justice. We have no right to stop standing up for righteousness. Um, and that's the tension that Christians live in. We have to recognize that we're not the ones who are going to save the city. We're not the ones who are going to save the world. Christ is redeeming the world, not us. And yet we don't get to sit around. We have to act. And so in our spheres of influence, we have to be able to say, okay, here are ways that I can treat my neighbor in a, in a more humane way that doesn't reduce them to a tool for my my pleasure, okay? Here are things that I can do, and it's not going to be perfect, but we can, and I think we do have an obligation to act. But, you know, you were saying that you think, okay, for example, pornography just can't continue like this. At some point, because it's inhuman, it's going to have to break. And there are a few... Um, you know, thinkers that I follow who who are sort of charting the fact that among young people, there is a kind of, it's it maybe it'll fizzle out, but there is a small movement of people who are recognizing that this is just, this is, sexual um, license is, is, it's toxic. It eats at us. It's not okay. And so a kind of movement back to commitment. And that's where I think, you know, you asked initially, what are the resources? Well, you know, things like marriage, this natural community that God has built into creation itself um, helps us, can help us so much. Um, but also the church, you know, we have a community in the church, uh, but we're going to need to do a lot of sacrificing 
in order to make that community meaningful. And what I mean by that is, you know, what you described earlier about saying, okay, I'm not going to take my kid, my kid to all these uh, enrichment activities or sports or whatever. That's the kind of sacrifices we have to be able to make if we're going to live meaningfully in community and have deep abiding relationships that will help us weather the storms of living in in any human society. And those are just, yeah, just some of the resources that we have. Well, I so appreciate talking with you, Alan. We read a lot of the same works and thus we follow a lot of the same, uh, same paths. And uh, it's interesting that before I settled on this, this gospel bound concept, this concept that um, we are bound to the gospel and therefore we abound in hope. We're tethered theologically Mm -hmm. to this historic belief, but this belief then helps us to withstand all the winds of change and so that we can abound in hope. One of the other uh, ideas that I toyed with was sober hope. Um, Mm -hmm. That was exactly the concept that came to me. Or if anybody's a out there listening and feeling especially discouraged, 2 Corinthians 4, so we do not lose hope, Uh, we do not not lose heart. Um, The theme of that that passage is what I come back to all the time Mm. in these conversations. Um, Let me wrap up with a final three here with Alan Noble. We've been talking about his new book with InterVarsity, You Are Not Your Own, Belonging to God in an Inhuman World. Quick answers here, Alan. Okay. How do you I'm find ready. how do you find calm in the storm? The most calming thing uh, for me right now is uh, doing the dishes and listening to T. S. Eliot read uh, Four Quartets. Ooh, okay, that is wonderfully specific. I like that. <laughs> I don't, it just is wonderful. And where do you find good news today, Alan? Um. With my students, honestly, with my students, because there is still a great um, hope and there's a, a joy. You know, I teach literature. The, the, the joy that I see in my students is they're, they're seeing uh, beautiful things and understanding it uh, as Christians. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. And I can ask an English professor this question. What's the last great book you've read? See, that's all, see, stop stereotype. Look, not all English professors have time. <laughs> <laughs> not to, only professors read. read books some of us are just teaching grammar out here <laughs> I, I, I i'm just trying to keep up with the reading assignments for my my classes uh i don't i don't know what the last great um uh, uh book that i read you know i read this is not fiction but uh the uncontrollability of the world hmm. by uh rosa is his last name i think he's german and uh it's not a, it's not a christian book but um, it's kind of taking the question of secularization um, from a different angle. Um, this this desire, these modern people, we have to ca- try to control everything, which I think I read it after I wrote this book, but after I, I read it and I was like, dang, I could have just inserted that everywhere. And <laughs> so that's fine. It's okay. That's good. We've been talking with Alan Noble. Um, I knew it'd be a fun time talking with Alan, author of You Are Not Your Own, Belonging to God in an Inhuman World new from InterVarsity. Alan, thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Gospel Bound. For more information, including past episodes, transcripts, and to sign up for my newsletter, go to tgc.org slash gospelbound. If you like what you've heard, you may also like my new book written with Sarah Zalstra called Gospelbound, Living with Resolute Hope in an Anxious Age. You can find it wherever books are sold.